6.30, and we're going to begin. Welcome to uh, week two in our class on the unseen realm. It's nice to see all of you here tonight. You came in tonight and you didn't receive class notes, and that's Dawn's fault. <laughs> they're printed and they're at home. So you got to get along without them tonight. I apologize for that. Uh, let me take care of a couple housekeeping things uh, before we begin. The first of which is, some people have asked me, what if there are some people you want to invite to the class that maybe haven't been here from the beginning? You know, can they come? And the answer to that is yes, they can. They're more than welcome to come. The only thing I'm asking is that if they do do that, take advantage of what's online so they can watch the previous classes so they know where we are. If they jump into the class at week three or four, it, it's going to be kind of tough for them to understand everything that's going on. So uh, that's the only stipulation on that. <clears throat> Also, in regards to the, if you're, if you're looking at my teaching notes that are also being published, in regards to the class notes, you'll notice that the outlines do not follow verbatim. The information does, but not the outline form. That's because when I'm consolidating things and summarizing things for your notes, class notes, which you don't have tonight, hopefully we'll change that next week, um, they don't correspond exactly with the numbers and the letters to my actual teaching notes, but the information will follow the same. <clears throat> All right, let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we begin this second week, we note that the first week we were taken with the idea of wonderment and awe for you as we peer in behind the curtain and see some of the things that are related in your word that relate to things that we can't see with our own eyes. We pray that as we study your word this evening, you'd help us to have eyes to see what it is that we need to see. And at the end of the day, Lord, I, I pray that we would have a, a sense of awe, wonder, and a sense of... Uh, worship before your throne for all of the majestic things that you have going on at the same time throughout the universe. So Lord, we turn to you at this time and we ask your blessing on our study. We commit it to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So you've had the introduction. And so tonight we're actually going to be lifting the curtain. We're moving into lesson two, and we need to get that up on the screen. Just lesson two, there we go. We um, are gonna be lifting up that curtain to peer behind it tonight. And we're gonna begin with some unusual passages of scripture. And let me set it up this way. <clears throat> so you're walking down a street that you've been down any number of times in the past, it's all typical to you. And then all of a sudden you come across something that is totally unusual on the street. Maybe it's beside the street or off to the side or in the middle of the street. It's unusual. You're surprised. Maybe you're even startled. You weren't expecting it. That's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture in this lesson, I've labeled as startling Old Testament text to begin our look behind the curtain. So we're going to begin tonight with Psalm 82. And we're going to begin with verse 1. <clears throat> and this is a good place to begin, to take a look at the unseen realm. Let's pick it up. I have three different uh, versions there. God presi presides in the great assembly. He renders judgment among the gods. Does it strike you as a little unusual there? The Christian Standard Bible renders it this way. God stands in the divine assembly. He pronounces judgment among the gods. What about the King James Version? God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. <laughs> now, when I was looking at this, I was thinking about some guy that back in the 1950s worked all day, comes home, gets a shower, 
plops down in his easy chair. His wife's out in the kitchen. She's making dinner. He pulls out his King James Bible and starts reading. He comes across Psalm 82. And he's reading this, and all of a sudden his wife hears, Hey, Mabel, hold the phone. Take that meatloaf out of the oven. You got to come in here. We got to sit down and talk. You are not going to believe what I just read. Let's look at some more. How about the New King James Version? God stands in the congregation of the mighty, He judges among the gods. How about the ESV? God takes his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And the New American Standard, of which I preached and taught from for about 50 years, God takes his stand in his own congregation. He judges in the midst of the rulers. Now, this is very interesting how the NAS puts this. This is the only version that does this. We'll talk about it in a moment. Now, we need to examine what's going on in this passage. The Hebrew word Elohim is used twice in this short verse. Other than Yahweh, this is the most common word used in the Old Testament for God. However, Elohim is also used of de angels, demons, false gods, and even at times the spirit of man. Now let me back up for a moment here on these two terms. So when you're reading in your Bible in the Old Testament, the personal name of God is Yahweh. We get that when Moses is called by God, he's at the burning bush, you right, remember the scene, and he's learning that God has called him that he's going to be the one to lead the people out from Egypt. And Moses asks an honest question. Remember, he was from Egypt. They're going to the promised land. There's all kinds of gods that people are worshiping. He asks, well, who are you? And what is your name? And the response that he receives is Yahweh. Now, the Jews thought this was so holy of a name that they didn't put the vowel points in it. So we don't even know exactly how to say it. Okay? The English version, the Anglicans form to that, you may be more familiar with, is Jehovah. But this is the personal name of God. Yahweh, Hebrew, Anglic Anglic Anglicatized uh, version of it, uh, Jehovah. But we're not dealing with that word right now. The other common word that's used in the Old Testament is Elohim. So how do we understand this word Elohim? The first thing you need to understand about the term is that it can be both plural and singular depending upon the usage. We have English words that are made plural by adding an S or ES or an IES. Words like books or foxes, stories. You need your microphone up here. Would you come up? This is for my dear sister, Gail. She needs to hear me. And she can't hear if I don't have this on. Good? Good. So, we've got English words that we add S or ES or IES. Elohim in over 2,000 occurrences in the Hebrew Bible is singular and refers to the God of Israel, but it also may be plural, too. The word El, okay, on the front end, is an abbreviation form of Elohim, and both terms are better understood as a title or a description. 
In fact, the word El is often joined with other terms that indicate God's attributes. El Elyon, El Roy, you might not be familiar with those, but you might have heard of El Shaddai, okay, God Almighty. These terms that deal with his, his attributes are sometimes translated in our Bibles as Most High. God Most High, right? We have similar words in English that can be understood as plural or singular. An example of that would be a moose. It's plural or singular, depending on the usage. Sheep. Deer. Cod. Fish. Okay, so it's not unusual to us as English speakers. It is the surrounding words in a sentence that indicates a plural or a singular usage. It is the same with this Hebrew term Elohim. Now, when we look at Psalm 82, verse 1, we note the following, that the first occurrence of Elohim must be singular because the Hebrew grammar has the word as the subject of a singular verb. God takes his stand. Okay? God takes his stand. The second use of Elohim is plural because the preposition in front of it dictates that. In the midst of requires a plural understanding. He judges in the midst of. You cannot be in the midst of one. There's got to be a plurality that's there. Consequently, what you have in Psalm 81, excuse me, Psalm 82, verse 1, is the singular Elohim is presiding over an assembly of plural Elohim. The meaning of the text was interpreted by the New American Standard translators, the one, last one I gave you. They translated as rulers, oftentimes because they're concerned about polytheistic overtones. Now remember here, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are ardently monotheistic. So right off the bat, as we're lifting the curtain here, we gotta try to, we gotta deal with this. What's going on here? We believe there's one God, and yet it seems as though there's something else happening behind the scenes. As opposed to polytheism, the idea here is that God has called an assembly to judge the gods for corrupt rule of the nations. Now, as I mentioned, monotheism is intrinsic to Christianity, right? So, as opposed to polytheism, some people, including Michael Heiser, have opted for the term henotheism. It's appropriate for understanding lesser Elohim. The idea there would be the term refers to the belief that many gods exist, but only one may be worshipped. That's not bad, but I, I, another author by the name of uh, Chaffee, he offers, uh, he coins a word here called mono Yahwehism. The idea is that there's only one ultimate, all powerful God. So right at the beginning here, we want to make a distinction between Yahweh, who is an Elohim, and lesser Elohim. I want you to repeat after me. Lesser, lesser. Elohim. Elohim. Once again, lesser, lesser. Elohim. Elohim. Let's put them together. Lesser Elohim. <clears throat> By that, I mean this. <clears throat> These lesser Elohim do not possess the attributes, the characteristics that match the God that we worship every Sunday morning. Now, I just taught a class in this sanctuary on the attributes of God, a Sunday school class, through the summer. So let's just take a look at it. When we just talk about the incommunicable attributes of God, for example, how about omniscience? God is omniscient. He knows all things. Do these lesser Elohim possess that? 
They do not. Okay. Well, how about God is omnipresent? How about that? Are they, are they that way? The answer is no. They don't possess that. How about omnipotence? You know, are they all powerful? The answer to that is no, they're not. Question. And how do we know that? We, we know that because none of these attributes are ever ascribed to any other Elohim other than God himself. Ever. It's not even close. Let me give you another one. Um, immutability. The changelessness of God. God does not change because there isn't anything else that he is aware of or not aware of that would make a change, right? But here, how about this? His aseity. Aseity. It's A-S-E-I-T-Y. Aseity. Aseity concerns God's self-existence. In other words, God has always existed he exists, and he will continue to exist. He needs nothing. Okay? So what we understand here is, these lesser Elohim have none of these, including a seity, which means they themselves were created. Which means also... Whatever life they have is sustained in some way by Yahweh. Yes. Nadia, I need that microphone for we got questions that are coming up here. Right here. So what I want to know is what was the Hebrew word used for God's small g because, you know, the NSE, whichever one had rulers, I think there's a big difference between rulers and gods. So what was the Hebrew meaning and why do we have two different words? Elohim. And that's why the New American Standard Version, when they translate rulers, they footnote it and you go to the sidebar and they say literally, Gods, and I'll tell you why they did that in a little bit. Okay. Don, if you have Strong's, the Strong's Bible. Yeah. It'll I'm not the Strong's Bible. I have Yeah, so it'll tell you that it's. All right. Let's let's read the rest of the text and see what else is going on here. Okay. Picking up at verse two. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Sila, we think, means a pause. Vindicate the weak and the fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them out of the hand of the wicked. They do not know, nor do they understand. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are God's. And all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for it is you who possesses all the nations. Now, verse 6 makes it clear that these Elohim, these lesser Elohim, are known as sons of God. Please take note of the language. It's family language. We're getting an inkling here. We're getting a picture of something's going on behind the curtain. There's a family of God in the material world, but there's also a family in the immaterial world. They're called sons of God. <clears throat> The Hebrew here is, I have said you are God's Elohim and sons of the Most High. Banai Elion, all of you. Now, the Most High, Elion, is a reference to the power ascribed to the God of Israel alone. None of these beings have this power. But that phrase 
is translating, a, most high, is translating a variety of Hebrew words in conjunctions with one another. And so in my New American Standard Version, they're translating that 42 times in the Old Testament and eight times in the New Testament. It may vary in some of your other Bibles depending on how they translated it. But generally, most high is there. Now here's the thing I want to ask. Why do we have a designation most high if there's only one that exists? Once again, they in no way approximate or are on the same plane as Yahweh. They're not even close. But the God that we worship has called them gods. And they are sons of the Most High. Let me give you some examples of this Most High designation. Numbers 24, verse 16. The oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down yet having eyes uncovered. How about Psalm 7, verse 17? I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord Most High. Now, Psalm 82 is unclear. Is it all the Elohim that are under judgment or some? Yet some of the sons of God or sons of the, some of the sons of the Most High are clearly called Elohim, for the pronoun you in verse 6 is plural. No other way around that. Psalm 82, verse 6, you see it on the screen. I said, you are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Now let me give you some scholarly examination of this text. And I'm going to introduce to you some of these men's names, these authors' names, or I'm going to introduce you the, the commentaries, perhaps, that they've written in. Because most of you will not be unfamiliar with them, so I'm going to try to set that up a little bit. So this first one comes from Marvin Tate. I know you probably don't know anything about Marvin Tate. But there is a commentary. It's a multi-volume commentary. It's on the shelves of every seminary that I can think of. It's called the Word Bible Commentary. It takes up more than one shelf. All the Old Testament, all the New Testament, by multiple authors. That's not unusual for multiple comment commentaries of the whole Bible, usually as one editor. And Marvin Tate is the commentator here. The word Bible commentator is a very analytical, highly academic work. I mean, for most people, they wouldn't sit down and read the word Bible commentary. I mean, it's a little, it's like a little bit syrup. It's a little syrupy, but it's very respected. Here's Marvin Tate on this text. There is no good reason to doubt that God is the speaker in verses 2 through 4 and verse 7 and I think 6 as well. Psalm 82 opens up abruptly without introduction with an immediate focus on God, Yahweh, having taken his stand in the midst of a council or an assembly of divine beings while he pronounces judgment in verse 1. He is clearly in charge presiding over a meeting. The gods are divine beings who function as his counselors and agents. The scene is pictured as that of a divine assembly in which the great king pronounces sentence on some of the gods who have failed in their duties. The judgment of the gods, verse 7, strips them of their divine status and condemns them to a human fate of death. In the context of the Bible, there is a persistent nexus. Listen carefully between the heavenly realm and the realm of the world. Judgment activity on the earth interacts with that administrated by the heavenly authorities. The gods, patrons of the various nations, were responsible for the type of kings, judges, and officials they appointed and empowered. However, the gods, not even Yahweh, act directly. Their will is administered by human agents 
who are extensions of the divine presence in earthly affairs. Thus, the judgment of the gods is at the same time a judgment on human agents. All right, let me give you an illustration of how I think this works. We're starting to get the idea here, how did we get the powers of darkness? See, I'm just giving you a little bit of that this evening in this Psalm 82. How did the powers of, we know there had to be a rebellion, don't we? We know that there are demonic hosts that serve Satan. He's known as the God of this world. Am I right? That's what Paul describes him as. So how did that all happen? See, we're, we're beginning to get an inkling of how this all took place. But how does it affect human agency? Men and women who have free will, some of which become Adolf Hitler, and wreak all kinds of havoc on mankind. How does that work? Let me give you this illustration. <clears throat> so there's two men. One's named Bruce and the other one's named Tom. They work for a company, big high rise building. They got hired at the same time. They work in the same office. They're friends. <clears throat> But Tom is the first one to be advanced. He has a higher position. They still continue the relationship, but Bruce is feeling a little alienated about that. But it's not too long after that that Tom receives another promotion. And before you know it, he's now three floors up from where Tom and him used to work. There's a growing alienation on the part of Bruce concerning this. Because as the years go by, Tom continues to be advanced. He notices in a parking lot, there's a different car that, Tom's, that Bruce is driving now. It's more expensive. It's a higher salary. He's living in a better part of the city. And there's a growing animosity there on the part of Bruce about what's going on there. This goes on for several years, and this animosity keeps growing, and it's thicker and more involved. And Bruce is feeling like he's forgotten, and he begins to hate Tom. He hates him. And months go by, and months turn to years, and that animosity starts to entertain the possibility of actually murdering. Bruce, excuse me, Tom. <laughs> Bruce has this hostility towards him. And so it grows and grows and grows and another year and a half goes by and there at a moment when Tom is entering his uh, house, Bruce comes out from behind a bush and shoots him dead center in the chest, kills him. As this happens, he didn't figure on there to be witnesses. There's a witness, more than one. He gets charged, okay? This seems like pretty basic standard police work here. So as the police are doing their examination of the case, they discover that at Bruce's apartment, there's a computer there. And on that computer, they find 786 emails from a woman by the name of Sally. Sally lives in a different state. But as it turns out, Sally used to work at the same place. And in these 186, 386 emails, 786, huge number, what they find is over a period of two and a half years, Sally 
is fomenting an animosity that Bruce has for Tom. And it's Sally that actually says, you really need to think about doing away with him. Your life would be better without him. You could remove this agitation from your life. But how would, how would I do it? How could it be done? And Sally's right there with ideas on how that might happen. Now, in courts of law in this country, Bruce is involved in murder one, okay? That's what he's gonna be charged. But Sally has culpability. She didn't pull the trigger. She didn't buy the gun, but she was fomenting a murder. She, in effect, is behind the scenes doing this. I think this illustration points out the working of the powers of darkness behind the scenes where you have them fomenting evil, but at the same time, Humanity responsible for its decisions. In other words, there was no possession of Bruce. He didn't become an automaton. Of his own volition, he went out and bought the gun, plotted the day, the time, and how it would be done, put the bullets in it, pulled the trigger. These gods are being judged because they were patrons over nations. Now, we will examine this text in depth in the future. It's beyond the purview of where I'm at night, tonight to get into all the ramifications of this, okay? But this text, along with a couple other ones, will tell us how is it that the powers of darkness came to have regional authority. I'm thinking here of like Daniel, when the, when the angel comes to him and says, Daniel, <laughs> you're most favored. The day you prayed, I was sent with the message, but I've been engaged in a battle with the prince of Greece. Well, where did the prince of Greece come from? How did he get there? We're gonna deal with that in a later lesson. But right now, what we're building is this idea, there are lesser Elohim, and in this case, they're known as sons of God, and there's rebellion. There's rebellion. Now, I know a lot of what I've said tonight has hit you kind of like a curveball. You know, you weren't really maybe prepared for that. But at the same time, you all know there are the forces of darkness. You all know that they're spiritual beings, okay? You know that the Bible speaks about this in many places, particularly in the New Testament, okay? So there's nothing new there. What we're talking about is, how did this come about? We're peering under the curtain, and here it is in plain sight, the situation that we have here. How about another scholar? Here's F.F. F. Bruce. F.F. F. Bruce is deceased, very respected expositor of the Bible. He looks at this text, he, write, he, he writes these words. Nor is this an ordinary council meeting. It is a trial. And God presides not as the chairman, but as the judge. At this celestial Nuremberg, you know, here Bruce is harking back to World War II, right? Nuremberg was the trials after the World War, uh, World War II where the Nazis were prosecuted, right? At this celestial Nuremberg, he impatiently accuses the various national deities of misrule, of the powers delegated to them. Despite their supernatural rank and immortality, they are stripped of their privileges and suffer the degrading penalty of death. Derek Kidner, in the Tyndall Old Testament commentary series, notes as well that he looks at these different views in regards to this and says, 
These gods are indeed principalities and powers that have been delegated by Yahweh. And yet, there is resistance in broader evangelicalism, and for those of you that are familiar with reform thinking, in that, those camps to acknowledge that these are in fact divine beings. They would argue they are men, okay, functioning as leaders or judges. And this is why the New American Standard Bible is translating the way it does, which I think is very interesting because the New American Standard, the reason why I've preached out of it for so many years is because it's one of the most accurate Bibles you can find for word-for-word -word translation. In some ways, that's why the rank and file of the church sometimes doesn't like it, because it reads not as flowing. It doesn't flow like some of the other versions that are out there. It's a little on the choppy side. But it's choppy because they're striving so hard to get the right word to exactly translate it as it is there. <laughs> but in this case, they went out of their way to interpret instead of translate. On the flip side, to their credit, they footnoted it and said, literally, Elohim gods. J.J. Perot, in his, his comments on this, says this, they were sons of the highest, called by his name, bearing his image, exercising his authority, charged to execute his will, and they ought to have been in their measure his living representatives but they weren't. His view is they were human. But are these sons of the Most High divine beings or are they merely human judges? I would submit to you that the view I'm giving you tonight is indeed the minority report. But, as I said in the introduction, it's changing. It's changing. Interestingly enough, the Lord Jesus Christ quotes this song. <laughs> so let's skip ahead and let's take a look at John chapter 10. Jesus is declaring his godhood. We pick it up, John 10, beginning at verse 30. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. Jesus answered them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? There's your quote of Psalm 82. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scriptures can't be broken, how do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you're blaspheming? Because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not do the works of my Father, do not believe me. But if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. So those concerned over connotations of polytheism interpret gods as human judges. Now, how do they, how do, they do that? All right, how do they get that? They would look at a text like John 10, and they look at G, uh, Jesus quoting this. They already have a presupposition, Psalm 82 cannot be talking about divine beings. It has to be talking about human beings because there can't be any other gods. There's no, nothing else that has that designation. So with that understanding, they bring that forward in what Jesus' comments here, and they have, have Jesus basically saying, you never protested this use of the term. You never said that God, or Asap, who is the author of Psalm 82, committed an error by calling judges gods. So the idea is that the judge is kind of functioning as a god, but he's not really a god. 
But I want you to call to, I call to your attention this, that verse 34, Jesus answered and said to them, it has not been written in your law, I said you were gods, the quote of Psalm 82, is sandwiched between two claims of Jesus' own deity. And his assertion stresses his own deity. Look at it on the screen. Verse 30. I and the Father are one. There's your assertion there. Skip down to verse 38. But if I do not do them, he's talking about the works, though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am the Father. Verse 34 is sandwiched between them. Jesus answered them, has it not been written in your law? I said you are gods. Now, the judge's interpretation or the ruler's interpretation takes two forms. It's either A, Jewish elders, or B, the nation of Israel more broadly. That's how they look at this. Scholars assert that Psalm 82 is not technically part of the Torah, the first five books, which is true. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Psalms is not a part of that. Okay? Exodus 18 is where Jethro counsels Moses that he needs elders to function as judges. Do you remember that scene? Moses is exhausted in trying to determine all kinds of cases that the Israelites are bringing before him. He's tired. Jethro comes to him and says, you can't keep doing this. You've got to appoint other men to help you do this. And this is the, the beginning of the official designation of elders in the nation of Israel. It actually becomes, in my, my view, the platform for the basis of eldership that is taught even in the New Testament. Now, the human judge view does not make sense of anything that we've talked about. The Jews understood exactly what was meant. Verse 39, Elohim as a term means resonance and not a set of attributes. I want you to get that down. That is a Heiser quote. Elohim as a term means residence and not a set of attributes. In other words, God is an Elohim. He's a spiritual being. These other Elohim, they're spiritual beings. They're Elohims. It's what they are. But the God we worship is the most high. He is the creator. He is the sustainer. None of them other function in that way. Expositors who offer judges instead of the lesser Elohim idea do so because of polytheistic concerns. They're worried that if they surrender this, then we're surrendering a cardinal doctrine of not only Judaism but also Christianity that there's only one God. Yet, I'm stressing, there is only one God who is most high. There is only one God that is omniscient. There's only one God that's omnipresent. There's only one God that's omnipotent. There's only one God who has existed, exists now, and will continue to exist, and owes his existence to no one or anything else. All lesser Elohim cannot lay claim to any of those attributes. He is indeed the most high. My sense is that there is more here to the meaning than earthly judges. I think Tate's view that I began with is the best, but Alan Ross puts it this way in his commentary on the Psalms. He summarizes it, it's on the screen. The psalmist would not have accepted the idea that they were viable gods, but rather that they were supernatural beings or angels who formed a heavenly court, meaning an assembly of super supernatural beings appearing before God to receive their orders. And he gives a text there. We'll look at those in Job at a later date. These angelic beings were given the responsibility of overseeing the proper function of human society. However, many of them failed to comply with the divine commission and became the forces of evil of their nations represented by their gods. See, this answers the question of how did these beings come about? But beyond that, what we're understanding is there are beings. 
in the spiritual realm. Michael Heiser maintains that the understanding of the Elohim in Psalm 82, that the earthly judge's idea undermines Jesus' claim to deity and ignores how the quotation is bookend between the two suggestions of his deity. The context is part of the power of the quotation and the Jewish scriptures bore witness to this non-human sons of God. All right, so there's... Two steps here, I think, in Jesus' argument. Back to John 10. Why does he use this quote? He uses this to demonstrate that he's not a mere man. The divine beings of Psalm 82 are not mortal. This is Jesus' first step in his argument. They are gods. He hits them in the faith. He didn't hit them with anything they didn't know. He's just bringing it back to their remembrance. The second step is that he and the Father are one, verse 38. That is, if he's one with the Father, he's Lord of the council. He's over top of the council. The human judge view does not make sense of anything noted above. The Jews understood exactly what Jesus meant. Elohim as a term here means residence and not a set of attributes. I think that's what's going on. He has a two-step argument. One, he says, look, in your Old Testament, it says clearly that there are gods and that there's a Lord over them because Jesus presents himself not as a son of God, but he is the son of God. Now in this text, God says, I called you sons. But Jesus is always presented as the son of God. Two additional points. If it's the Israelites in general, that's being talked about here in Psalm 82 and picked up by Jesus in John 10. When were the Israelite judges ever given control of the nations? You ever think of that? When when were the Jews ever given control of that? I've never seen it. Secondly, If the Elohim that are talked about here in Psalm 82 are only human judges, then why then the judgment, you will die like men? Why is you will die like men of any significance if you're already human? You're going to die like a man anyway. The earthly judge's interpretation of Psalm 82 does not make sense. The clearest reading of the text, and this is, this, is, this is what we get into here, the clearest reading of the text is God called them gods. And they are being judged for their corrupt rule. And consequently, they'll die like men. But because of this idea of monotheism, well, we can't have that. So we've got to come up with this earthly judge idea. But when you understand that these gods in no way approximate Yahweh, then you understand there is nothing wrong with our monotheistic understanding that there is only one most high God. I noted in the opening lecture that there is an emphasis among some evangelicals, I think well-intended, to demythologize portions of scripture on some points. I would submit to you that the human judge interpretation of Psalm 82 is an example of that. I think it's being stripped of the supernatural that's there. It's clearly there. I understand why they're doing it, but the clearest reading of the text is 
God created them and gave them a responsibility and they rebelled. Now, we don't know, we haven't talked about why did they rebel or when did this delegation happen. We haven't talked about that yet. All I'm introducing to you right now is they exist. Biblical writers consistently assign unique qualities to Yahweh. He is all-powerful. Look at it on the screen, Jeremiah 32. The Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power, by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? That is never said of another Elohim, a lesser Elohim. It's only spoken about the Most High. He's sovereign and king over the Elohim. Psalm 95, verse 3. The Lord, the great God, the great king above all gods. The host of heaven are clearly subservient here. The members of the host council offer God worship to him alone. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. Remember, Deuteronomy is largely a collection of sermons given by Moses to the nation before they made the track in to the promised land. We pick it up. Chapter 4, beginning of verse 19. Well, let me note the language here. Moses as the writer. And beware not to lift up your eyes to heaven and see the sun, the moon, the stars, all the hosts of heaven and be drawn away and worship them and serve them, those to which the Lord your God has allotted to all the other peoples of the whole under heaven. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the fern, iron of the furnace from Egypt to be a people for his own possession as it is to this day. Let's examine this more closely. Okay, so he mentions here the sun, the moon, the stars, the host of heaven. Okay, so people have been worshiping these since the beginning of time, just about. Be careful that you are not drawn away to worship them and to serve them, which the Lord your God has allotted to all the other peoples under the whole heaven. Now, what I want you to see is, if he's talking here about the literal sun and the moon and the stars, don't you think the sun shined on Israel? Don't you think the stars were over top of the nation of Israel? How about the moon? Was the moon shining there? But Moses is clearly saying here, they were allotted to the other peoples. This is an allusion back to Psalm 82. They were delegated. Again, you don't know when, because we haven't covered that yet. You don't know how it happened. We haven't covered that yet. All I'm introducing you to is the idea tonight, they exist. They're called sons of God. They are part of a council. God, in Psalm 82, holds a special council meeting. It is a judgment session. He's not asking for any input from anyone. And he judges them. I want you to know, too, that these sons of God, they only offer worship to Yahweh. Job chapter 38, verse 7. When the morning stars sang together, all the sons of God shouted for joy. There's that language again. The sons of God. They were there at creation. And they were worshiping God. Nehemiah chapter 9 notes explicitly that Yahweh is unique. You alone are the Lord. You have made the heavens, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is in it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and the heavenly host bows down before you because he's the most high. Now, a companion text here to Psalm 82 is Psalm 89. We'll pick it up, chapter 89, verses 5 to 7.
The heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord. That's Yahweh. I'm putting that in there for you. Your faithfulness also in the assembly of the holy ones. Okay? For who in the skies is comparable to the Lord? It's Yahweh. Who among the sons of the mighty, this is Elohim, is there, is like the Lord. A God greatly feared in the council of the holy ones and awesome above all those who are around him. You have the word of God that is clearly teaching us they exist. They're there. They were made by him. He uses them. He brings them together in a council. He gives them responsibilities. They worship him and are to be obedient to him alone. But some don't. Um, Psalm 89, I'm not sure. It would probably be marked in your Bibles. 82 for sure is. All right, here are the observations here on Psalm 89. Who among the sons, in, uh, verse 6, the New American Standard footnotes that, sons of God. The ESV renders it this way. Who among the heavenly beings? The Septuagint, which is the translation that Jesus and the apostles used, has it this way, and who shall be likened to the Lord among the sons of God? The Septuagint translates saints in verses 5 to 7, while the New American Standard translates it holy ones. Alan Harmon, in a mentor commentary series on the Psalms, this is a reformed leading commentary series, writes, the phrase heavenly beings or sons, is literally sons of God. An expression also used in Psalm 29. The council of the holy ones seems to equate with a congregation of the holy ones. See, we're, we're peering under the curtain. We're looking in there. There's, there's a council. There's worship. There's job descriptions. There's responsibilities that are given. And there's accountability. Psalm 29, verse 1. Ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. The divine assembly is located in heaven. It is not on earth. The Hebrew term kadashim is used twice in verses 5 and 7 of Psalm 89. Some English translations have it as saints, but this is misleading. And Van Geermans adds this in his commentary. He says, the rule of God is unquestioned by his holy ones. That's the expositor's Bible commentary. That's a very broadly used evangelical commentary. Expositor's commentary, William Van Geermans. The rule of God is unquestioned by his holy ones, and he includes this, who are heavenly beings. Heavenly beings. We live in a material world. They live in a spiritual world. There's another world. Now what I want to just, just begin, if you think of it this way, it's like a picture, okay? Four sides. I'm like this with every bit of my strength trying to push this way and push this way and I'm trying to get this up this way and push this down this way so that you guys would see it is much bigger than all that we can see with our eyes. God is that big. He is that big that he is dealing with everything in the heavenlies as much as he's dealing with everything here. Now I say to Dieter often, uh, we'll be talking about something and uh, some current event happens, you know, pick the news, something on the, you know, Facebook, something going on, and I'll say to her something like this, what God sees in a day's time, what God sees in a day's time. I mean, you've had thoughts like that. I mean, I mean do you think to yourself, how bad can it get? 
you know, the recent story, I'm still astounded by this, is that there, there was a, a woman who's running for public office in the state of Virginia. A young, a young woman. She's an attractive woman. She's a nurse. She's got two small children, and she decides to start making pornographic films and uploads it to the Internet. That in itself is astounding, but what slays me is the Democratic Party of Virginia has embraced her. This is a good thing. Embraces her. So I look at this and I say, what God sees in a day's time. But then when I start to do a study like this, what God sees throughout the universe. And he still controls it for his own good pleasure. Can you imagine a God this big? It's awe-inspiring. He's that big. Now, I mentioned that it's a minority report on Psalm 82, but things are changing. Even within Reformed theological circles, you know, these are the guys that we want to know exactly what the Bible says. You know, we want expository sermons. We want, to, we want it broken down verse by verse. We want to know what it says, which I'm, wholly, I'm completely in agreement with. You can't get, I don't think, today, anything more reformed than Ligonier. How, do, how many of you know what Ligonier is? Let me see your hands. Okay, some of you don't. Okay, so... Ligonier is a small town in the state of Pennsylvania. It's 45 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. It's where I grew up, it's Pittsburgh. I never knew, I knew Ligonier was there. As it turns out, R.C. Sproul, some of you know that name, okay? He grew up in a dead Presbyterian church in Pleasant Hills of the city of Pittsburgh happens to be the same church that I grew up in. I never knew him. He was older than me. Years later, when I first started my work here in Owasso, and I was trying to understand what in the world I really believed, <laughs> I started looking for better and more deeper theological understanding of the scripture. It wasn't too long I got on to the Philadelphia Conference on Reformed Theology, and I discovered R.C. Sproul. We used to take groups from this church all over the country going to these various conferences. That's when I learned about Ligonier. Ligonier was the place where R.C. Sproul began his ministry of teaching adult ed through VHS tapes. He was one of the first instructors to use the medium of video. Okay? It was done at Ligonier. There was a woman by the name of Dora Lee Hillman her husband was, owned the Hillman Coal Company, owned all the barges that went up and down the Monongahela, the Allegheny River, and the Ohio River that fired all those, coal plant, all those uh, steel plants all over the city back in the day. She delegated that land at Ligonier, Pennsylvania for R.C. Sproul to begin his ministry there. Okay? That's where it began, 45 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. Most people in Pittsburgh didn't even know his name. It's a great example of a prophet is without honor in his own town. And I went down there a couple times you know, for various classes that were going on there. Eventually, Ligonier gets so big, they move, and they move to Orlando, Florida. If so if you're not familiar with Ligonier, just Google it, and you're going to pull up all kinds of information. Google R.C. Sproul, who is now deceased. You'll bring up all kinds of videos and all kinds of things you can get. Purchase some of it. A lot of it's free online. Here's my point. Ligonier produces a monthly magazine called Table Talk. Okay? It's a Bible study program. They go through books of the Bible. Each day has a passage. You read a brief commentary on it. It goes page by page. On the weekend, they have various articles about some topic that the magazine's about that month. 
Burke Parsons is the editor of Table Talk magazine. Burke Parsons was the heir apparent to take over for R.C. Sproul in his pastoral duties at St. Andrew's Church in Lake Mary when R.C. died. Burke Parsons is the pastor there now, and he's now the editor of Table Talk magazine. You with me? Okay. Table Talk magazine, May issue 2022. So about a little bit over a year, a year ago. In that article, it was talking about uh, a passage in Exodus. I don't know that Parsons, Burke Parsons wrote this, but he's the chief editor, so I'm assuming he signed off on it. Here we go. Moses asks, who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Exodus 15, 11. It would be tempting, writes the author, to pass over this line quickly, viewing it only as poetic language that does not ascribe any kind of real existence to other gods. But scripture will not let us do that. Many biblical texts refer to gods as if they are real beings. But of course, other passages indicate that gods are but worthless idols and speak of the Lord as the only God. Do we have a contradiction here? We can see that the answer is no, one, is no once we understand biblical monotheism. This doctrine states that there is only one eternal self-existent God who created all things. But it does not deny the existence of other supernatural beings such as angels, angels and demons. Other gods mentioned in scripture have a real existence, though not as deities, but rather as demons whom human beings have knowingly or not regarded as gods. So Moses' question in Exodus 15, 11 is not simply metaphorical. Rather, the prophet compares God to other beings that are worshiped as gods. The expected answer to the question, of course, is no one. There is no one like the Lord among the gods, 2 Samuel 7. And in fact, God stands among the gods, various demons, not as their equal, but above them as their creator. He made the beings known as gods originally very good, but they fell and became his enemies, end quote. Tremper Longman, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary regarding Psalms and Psalm 82, writes this. He says, whenever a hymn speaks of those other divine powers whose existence is by no means denied on theoretical grounds, it can only be with reference to the one who will call their actions to judgment, i.e. Psalm 82, or in a spirit of superiority that mocks their impotence. God is omnipotent. But they are impotent. They are spiritual beings. They in some ways are greater than we are. In some ways. But they're impotent compared to the God of the Bible. The Holy Council of God. It's been used several times tonight. The ESV translates it that way. Divine Council. Sometimes you'll see this entire theological endeavor abbreviated under that designation, divine counsel. It comes right out of the scripture. A holy assembly, God's own congregation. There's, there are congregations here. There are congregations there. So what are we learning? We're learning that God assembles and uses a holy council around his throne. They are lesser Elohim. They are referred to as gods. They are called that by God himself and have their origin and sustenance owed to the God most high. He is alone the creator and the sustainer and all worship must only be due him and him alone. But what we will learn is these beings are drunk for their own worship. 
I want some for me. There's much of this that we're going to learn that corresponds with some of our own nature. We all want a little bit from me, don't we? And what we're learning as believers, it's all about him. It's not about me. If you want to go up in the kingdom of God, you've got to learn how to go down. You may be asking, and we asked, posed this last week, why in the world would God need a council? And the short answer is, he doesn't need one. But he has one. Now, I laid on you a lot tonight. Tonight was your baptism. Okay? <laughs> We got a long way to go, okay? But you heard some things tonight you probably never even thought of. So I'm going to pause here, and I will take. Do you have any questions, anything you want to ask or comment on and what's been said? Bob, go ahead, hold on. Let me get you on the mic. So I want to clarify something. You've had two analogies, one you made and one I think Bruce made, where he's saying this was like Nuremberg. And you're I saying that Bruce it, made that. Right. And you're saying you had your analogy where it was like this murderous employee who has some girlfriend who's No, no. They were not the same. FF uh, Bruce No, I know they're not the same. I'm, I'm, okay. what I want to do is I want to clarify because what you were saying is having this murderous girlfriend is she's like the Elohim. Bruce is saying, no, the murderous, the Elohim, they're like Hitler. They're like all the little guys that were running with Hitler. Now, in Bruce's analogy, those guys get hung. God is saying, we're gonna kill, I'm going to kill you guys too because you're the same thing like the Nazis. In your analogy, if I'm understanding it, and that's what I want to clarify, she wouldn't get hung. She'd maybe get charged with, you know, you know, some kind of lesser thing, accessory to the in fact. Our court, in our court system. Right. Yes. But, but she is... Guilty. The Elohim are guilty. They, they are. Actually, and they're responsible, just like That's the good. whole thing with Nuremberg said, if you get a bad law, a bad order, you're not allowed to yeah. follow it. It's a, it's, it's a good point. It's a valid point you're making, and I think it's right. The, way, the reason why I want that, I wanted to give you that analogy, though, I wanted you to see that because you have lesser Elohim that foment evil, that foment temptation, men and women are still culpable for their decision. We're never going to be able to stand before God and say, well, you know, the devil made me do it. That isn't going to fly. Somebody else had a question. Mike. Kind of getting to the whole root of this, uh, if I understand correctly, God created Satan, a beautiful creature. He got puffed up. He became prideful. He rebelled. What in him, being a perfect creature by God, obviously God is designed, he knows everything. In some ways, he's orchestrating this. Yes. So okay. I'm trying to understand okay. why. He, here, here's the thing. There's such a correspondence here to human beings. I know why you sin and why I sin. You and I were born in sin. Our parents and their parents, we all had sin passed on to us because we're all sons and daughters of Adam, right? Okay. You and I, all of us, were born with a nature bent towards going the wrong way, okay? But the $64,000 question, and there's not a theologian on the planet that can answer this, is why did Adam, who was born completely perfect without an evil nature, choose to believe Satan's word over God's word? It's the same thing with these Elohim. It's, in my view, it's the same. And yet, God foresaw it, God ordained it. 
Anyone else? Right here. Just a very simple question. So the Jews had their Psalms. I mean, they had all their scriptures. Do, do they or did they believe that there were these Elohim, these lesser gods? They had no problem with this. And remember, these are the Jews of Deuteronomy 6. Hear o, hear, o Israel, the Lord our God is one God, right? They had no problem with this because they understood they were lesser Elohim. They in no way were like Yahweh. Question over here. So th th this question is, if God has no time, if he's before, present, after, if all was wrapped up into one, when does God need counsel? It's already happened. It happened before. It happened <laughs> now. It's ha when did God need counsel? Jim, why does he need us? You know, I, I look at this thing at times when I think about the evil of the world and what God puts up with. But somehow, all of this, whether it's what we can't see or what we see, is used of the God of the universe within his own infinite wisdom to reveal his plan. And it's not our place to question his wisdom. See, I am, we're leading, we're looking into things we don't usually think about. But I can only take you so far looking under that curtain. Only so far. There's a universe behind that curtain. The infinite wisdom of God that's there. Yes. I think when we hear the word counsel, in our minds we're thinking, I need you to give me instruction. I need your opinion. And I don't believe that's what it's referring to. The Bible says that Satan came before the Lord. And the Lord said, what you been up to? Okay, now God knows what he's been up to. So that's, to me, that's the counsel. He's giving them the opportunity because they're not infinite. They do have time to just tell him what they're doing. It's not that he needs their counsel. He's just including them in I, I agree with you. And right, you're right as far as including them. But next week, the council convenes. And he, and, and he asks them their opinion. <laughs> I mean, if you ever want to have your mind blown, <laughs> this is what you start reflecting on. But the end of it is, is he that big? And the answer is, yeah, he is. And you know, when I'm looking at him and he's that big, and I think, how in the world did he take any knowledge or any desire to have a relationship with me? I mean, a being that is this big, with all of these things in play at the same time, he got this little Italian guy from Pittsburgh who's a God player doing his own thing. And the God of the universe invaded my life. It's incredible. It's incredible. Not only that he invaded my life, I was hostile to him. I wanted to be the God of my own life. Isn't it interesting that at the beginning of the beginning of the first sin, what was the temptation? <laughs> to be like that was the temptation of Satan. You can be like the Most High. Satan 
or the serpent, we're, we'll talk about that. The serpent in Genesis chapter 3, I think the ploy that was used with Adam and Eve is the very thing that the lesser Elohim submitted themselves to. We all want to be God. I can do, Chuck said, I can do better. Isn't that right? But again, I'm going to leave you with this. There's no help for angels. But there was help for you. There was help for you. You want motivation to get out of that bed on Sunday morning and be here 25 minutes ahead of time? This is it. Heads back, eyes wide open, arms raised, mouth bellowing out. Worship to the one true God. He's worthy for us to be on time. He's worthy for us to lift up our voices. He's worthy for my wallet and what money I have and resources to use for the work of the kingdom. He's worthy of that. Lowliness and the pitiful sin that we've all been involved in. And he chose to love us in spite of ourselves. I close with this that this view that I articulated tonight is not detrimental to monotheism. God is the one self-existent, holy, all-powerful God. But he has an assembly. He has a council. And next Monday night, the council will convene. We'll see you then.